It's really what this, um, what this series really is all about. We are uh, in a series we've been calling the Intimate Pursuit. The Intimate Pursuit is really about one thing, and that is developing an intimate friendship with the Lord. How many of you want an intimate friendship with God in this room? That is what we were after in this series, just the simplicity of that. There's no other agenda. There's no other goal. The one goal is to learn how to have an intimate relationship with the God of the universe, the one who is alive, the one who is pursuing you since the beginning of time. He's been pursuing us for this intimate relationship since before you were born. And so we're learning how to cultivate that, how to steward that. So in two weeks ago in week one, last week was Mother's Day, two weeks ago in week one we, we talked about this, that there's really, it boils down to three different types of believers. There are the believers who've never learned how to have this intimate friendship with the Lord. They've never really learned how to go into the secret place to develop this. What ends up happening when you're one of those believers is your life just feels almost frustrated at times because you know that there's more. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, man, why is it feeling this way? Why am I struggling so much? It's because there's this tension there because you know there's more of God, but you're not sure how to necessarily get there. The, uh, the second category of believers is those that only learn to go to the secret place when things are difficult and times are hard. They've learned to go to the Lord in the middle of crisis. And I just believe, man, it, that's really how uh, initially sometimes how we learn how to go to the secret place. I know it's true for my life. I, I learned how to go to the secret place at a very young age that I needed God desperately when I had crisis in my life. And so you learn how to go to the secret place when you, when you, need, when you need God, but not necessarily in every single season. The goal is for us as a people to learn to go to the Lord in every single season of life. Not just when we need Him, but every single morning, whenever we wake up, that we would go in the secret place because there's this relationship that we've developed and we want to meet with this God who is alive and continue this friendship with the Lord. At some point, it gets beyond even a discipline. It gets to a place where you're just hungry to meet with the Lord. Because what do we say about hunger? Uh, physical hunger, the more you eat, uh, the more you're full. But the, when it comes to hunger for the Lord, spiritual hunger, the more you eat, the more you desire to be with the Lord. So our hope is that we would get into that place to where it's no longer necessarily a discipline, although it's a discipline at times, but it's just this desire to be with God in every single season. So that was... Week one recap. Uh, this morning, what I want to do is I want to show you how to see God in the secret place. I want to show you how to see God in the secret place. What I mean is I want to show you how to see what God wants to show you when you go into the secret place, when you go to spend time with Him. I want to also give you just some practical advice on, on that. Uh, and so I've entitled my message this morning this, Seeing God in the Secret Place. Seeing God in the Secret Place. If you like my notes, you can text notes to the number that's coming up on the screen and receive what is in front of me. Uh, Matthew 6.6 6 is our, our verse uh, this morning, uh, really for this entire series. So let's read this to start off with, and then I'm going to pray and dive into the message. It says this, but you... When you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. That's something you need to know. He's already in the secret place. He's waiting to meet with you. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Let's pray this morning. God, we love you so much. And Lord, we don't want to just say that without it being a heart posture, God, of, our, of who we are, Jesus. 
But Lord, we love you and we are so desperate for you. Make us a desperate people. Make us a hungry people. God, I pray that every single person in this room would learn, God, how to steward our time with you, Jesus, in the secret place. God, what we want more than anything is this intimate friendship with you, Father, that you have been pursuing since the beginning of time for us because, God, you love us so much, Jesus. And because of, the, of, of, of your Son, we are made righteous. And so, God, we can boldly approach your throne. We can boldly come in this secret place, God, despite anything that's going on in our life, Jesus. We can have this relationship with you. So, Father, as we pray so often, God, the Lord, I, I pray that, God, you would speak this morning for your servants are here and we are listening. God, we are your servants. God, I pray this morning as we open your word, God, your logos, your written, your written word, that God, you would make it alive in us, God. Make it alive. Make it active, God. May we put it into practice, God. We love you. We bless you. And everyone said this morning, come on, somebody. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Wesley. Appreciate it, man. I, um, I had this really beautiful, amazing car about five years ago. And I'm being very sarcastic when I say that. It was a 1999 Corolla. It, had, it was tan, but then it had a green uh, hood on it. Okay? It was beat up. It, uh, things were falling apart on the interior, but what I loved about it was it got me from point A to point B. You know what I'm saying? But what I loved even more about it is it only cost me $700. I didn't have a car payment. It was amazing. It was incredible that that wasn't something hanging over me. So I drove this car. It was wonderful. I, I really enjoyed driving it. It was almost like a badge of honor for me. Uh, but what I liked about it even second most is that you know, the, the key at one point, it broke off in the ignition. So with the key broken off the ignition, I just said, okay, I'm going to leave the key in the car because it's an old car. It's beat up. If anybody needs the car, they can take it. It's not a big deal, right? 700 bucks. They need it more than I do. And so if you know me personally, you know this about me, that I'm not good at keeping up with stuff, especially if it's just minor in my life. So uh, I'm always looking for my keys, like it feels like. I, I, I'm missing them left and right, and it just feels like, okay, I cannot find them anywhere. So uh, what I love about Laura, though, is she's very good at seeing the keys when she goes to look for them. <laughs> I will look in the same place, and then Laura will come and look in that place, and she will find them because she sees them. How many know what I'm talking about? Anybody else in this room like that? I am so thankful for my wife that is able to find my keys when I'm missing them. There is a difference between looking for something and seeing something. Looking for something is different than seeing something. To see is to perceive it. When you see something, you are able to perceive it, you're able to find it, right? But just looking for something that's completely different. Moses, when he was in Exodus chapter 3, he looked at the burning bush, but then he had to take time to go see it. Let's read the story right now. Exodus chapter 3, verse 3, it says this. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back to the desert, and he came to Oreb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked. Everybody say, looked. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Imagine that, seeing a bush on fire and they being not consumed. Why, though? Because the presence of God was there. Verse 3, then Moses said, I will now turn aside. So he's stopping what he's doing in that moment to turn aside, to go look, go see what is happening going on. What was he doing? He was tending his flock, reading on. Then Moses said, I will turn aside and see. Everybody say, see. see. I will see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take off your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moses had to look 
before he was able to see. He had to look before he was able to see. The Lord didn't speak to him until he took time to see. When you go into the secret place, the goal is simple. It is to see what God wants to show you. If you go into the secret place only to look, what ends up happening is you walk away learning something only intellectually. There's nothing wrong with studying the Scripture and learning intellectually Scripture, but when you go to see, what happens is God gives you revelation, and what should revelation do? Revelation should transform you. So when we're going to the secret place, we're going to see so that we are then transformed by the Word of God. We're going to see, not just to merely look. How do you see, though? Really, really two ways how you see. You take the time to go see. What did Moses do? He turned aside. He took the time to leave what he was doing and to go see what God wanted to show him. What's the other way that you see? You see by knowing you're coming to a place of holy ground. And so what do you do? You come with a pure heart. How do you see? You come with a pure heart. Moses, what did he do? He came before the Lord and he took off his sandals before the Lord. Before the priests went into the holies, what did they do? They washed their hands, they washed their feet. Why? Because of purity. They were going to see. Moses took time to turn aside in order to see. In order to see, it also takes purity of heart. It says this in Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the what? The pure in heart. For they what? They see God. A biblical definition of a person who has a pure heart is this. One who loves God with all of his heart, with an undivided loyalty. It's simply this. It's one whose heart is completely God's. There's no other agenda. There's no other pursuit. It's one whose heart is completely God's. God, we talked about this in, uh, two weeks ago, that God is a jealous God. He wants nothing more than all of us, right? So purity of heart is how you see God. Understand this, to see God is to know God. The purification process really happens two ways. It's this, it's making Him Lord of our life. Now, making Him Lord of our life is the easiest way to have a purity of heart. Right? It's, it's saying, Lord, you can have all of me. Lord, I, I'm allowing you to look at me and to purify anything inside of me. The other way you have purity of heart is much harder. It's by refinement. Refinement process with the Lord is not always easy. It's difficult. The Lord often will speak to us and then we're not obedient, so he allows refinement to happen in our life. How are we refined? We're refined by the fire of God. We're refined by uh, pruning, and we're refined by crushing. <laughs> All three of those are something that you don't want to experience oftentimes. And sometimes, though, we have to learn the hard way. The fire of God comes and burns away everything that is not of Him. The pruning comes and He cuts away relationships. He cuts away things that are not of God. He, the pruning process is hard and difficult. What is the crushing process? The crushing process is allowing this, uh, this softened heart to be able to receive from the Lord, right? In order to see God in the secret place, you've got to come with a pure heart. Moses came with a pure heart. In Exodus 3, Moses began right here in this moment to develop this intimate friendship with God because he took the time to turn aside. He came with a pure heart. This was his first encounter with God. And his relationship, this intimate friendship with the Lord in which Moses experienced, it started right here at the burning bush, and it grew exponentially from there. At the burning bush, he realized his call to uh, rescue uh, Israel through the power of God out of Egypt, right? Then he started developing this friendship with the Lord, and out of this friendship with God, he would often go outside of the camp to go meet with the Lord. It was known as the tent of meeting in Exodus chapter 33. You can read about it. Moses would go outside of the camp. Jesus, what would he do? He would go outside of the camp. 
John the Baptist, to get his calling to prepare the way of the Lord, what did he do? He went to, into the wilderness to get his calling outside of the camp. In Hebrews 13, 13, God also, the writer of Hebrews, calls us to go outside of the camp. It says this, therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Outside the camp is a place that's outside the normal patterns of life, right? It's outside your normal physical space or place, outside normal cultural influences. Outside the camp is where you go meet with God. It's your distraction-free place. It's the secret place, a place God is literally waiting for you. Here's the thing about this place, that not many are willing to go to this place to meet with the Lord. My prayer for every single person in this room is that we would be a people who are willing to go outside the camp, to go into the secret place, to learn how to meet with the Lord. Anybody else desire that in this place? That we would be those people, amen? Here's the thing about this. The secret place is where the power of God flows from. In the secret place is where we meet with God in his presence. And as we meet with the Lord in his presence, that is where the power of God flows from. That was what was beautiful about the people who met with the Lord, uh, the Holy Spirit in the upper room that day. They were filled with power to go and to be witnesses. Without that power, as the Holy Spirit, as, God, as Jesus told them right before he left, go and wait. It takes waiting. Go and wait. I'm going to pour out my spirit. They needed the spirit, the Holy Spirit, to go and to walk into power. This is what I feel like the Lord kind of spoke to me specifically for some of you in this room this week as I was praying. I feel like he's saying to many of you in this morning, you're battle weary. You're battle weary. What I'm saying is that you were trying to engage in spiritual warfare without going into the secret place. You're thinking, okay, I'm going to do spiritual warfare because you're aware of the attacks of the enemy and what is happening. And so you, you go and you try to do spiritual warfare without going into the secret place to be filled up by the Spirit of God. You cannot go and do spiritual warfare without going into the secret place. You're going to feel tired, burnt out, and battle weary every single time. You've got to be a person who goes in the secret place to meet with the Lord, to hear the voice of God, to see what he wants to show you, so then when you go do spiritual warfare, you're already filled up. Without that filling up, you are going to be left feeling exhausted. And I'm just telling you here this morning this, is that I believe there's many people in this room who are feeling battle-weary and exhausted. My encouragement to you is to go to the secret place. Not even to win a battle, but to develop this friendship with the Lord. And out of this friendship with God, what happens is you just, you, you feel empowered, right? You feel the Spirit of God within you and this power that you begin to walk in and no longer are you battle weary anymore. You received that this morning? So this is what I want to do right now. On your seat, uh, you should find this. It's an intimate pursuit, God. I want to walk you through this. So some of you in this room, I'm just convinced that many people, when they go in the secret place, they're not even sure how to approach it. They're not sure what to do. So I want to give you some practical advice this morning on how to go into the secret place. Now let me say this as well. This is not the only way to spend your time in the secret place, okay? This is a way. And so some of you in this room, you might take some things from this and incorporate it into your time with the Lord. Some of you in this room, you might uh, take this and you might, man, I'm not sure how to do this yet. I'm going to follow this thing to the T. And this is what I believe, man. Like if you follow this when you go into the secret place and you develop this heart posture, which we're about to talk about here in a moment, that you will grow in the Lord exponentially. I promise you, there's no way you don't. If you go every single morning, every time you wake up, I said the first week, there's something about first fruits. There's something about waking up in the morning or waking up whenever you wake up, if you're, if you're on shift work or something different, your schedule's different, and spending time with the Lord as soon as you wake up. There's something about it. You're giving that first few hour, that first hour to the Lord, that first 15, 30 minutes to the Lord. If you do that and you walk through this, you will be forever changed. You'll notice a difference within two weeks. 
I promise you, you'll notice the difference within a month. You'll develop a relationship with the Lord. So this is something I put together. This is, I've been tweaking uh, this over the years in my own personal life. And I also want to say this, that I am not perfect in this area, okay? I don't, wanna, I don't want you to perceive that uh, I'm this, some great, amazing person who does this every single day. I mean, I, I really want to. I really want to get to that level. It, but oftentimes, you know, I, I do fail. And I'm not trying to make that excuse. What I'm trying to say is I'm encouraging you. If you miss, no big deal. Just start back the next day, okay? There's not a single person who's perfect in this room, right? So let's dive into this really practical advice on how to steward the secret place in order for you to see what the Lord wants to show you. How many of you want to see what God wants to show you when you go in the secret place? Amen. All right, here's the first thing this morning. Number one, you worship and you pray in the Holy Spirit. You worship and you pray in the Holy Spirit. This is a step that you cannot afford to miss when you go into the secret place. Because what worship does when you enter into the secret place is it sets your heart to be able to receive from God. It humbles you, right? That's what worship does. What are you doing when you worship God? You are making Him Lord of your life. And as you make Him Lord of your life, you are humbling yourself to be able to receive from God. And so as you worship him, it's putting you in the right heart posture to be able to receive from him. What it also does, you know how when you get, uh, and you sit down or read the word of God, sometimes it just feels like, man, I just, my mind is going this way and that way, and I feel like I can't concentrate right now. Anybody else been there before? I know I've been there before. It's just like I read something in the word, and all of a sudden I have no idea what I just read. And you're like, man, I have to go back and read now. Worship kind of sets the tone, not that it won't ever happen, but it will help with that, uh, that, that, that issue maybe that you might be having to where there's no distractions, where your mind is just set on the Lord. Because when we're reading Scripture, we're not reading for knowledge, we're reading to encounter God, right? We're reading to encounter Him. So worship creates a distraction-free zone. So what you're doing when you go to the secret place, you want to learn from God. You want Him to show you things. You want to be able to see and perceive what He's what he wants to show you when you're going to the secret place. Uh, think about it like this. If I was going into a meeting with someone who is a mentor in my life, and I'm having lunch with them, imagine if I put my phone face up on the table, and I didn't put it on silent, and every time someone texted me, called me, I would answer it, right? I'm not going to receive and to see what they're trying to show me, right? I want to set my heart to be able to see what the Lord wants to show me in that secret place. So worship sets the stage for no distractions. So just a couple of practical things that you can, you can do is, uh, in, in, in the secret place to start off with worship is you can put on your favorite worship song just to encounter the Lord, right? Lately, that last song that we just, we just sang, man, I've been having that uh, for the past two weeks on repeat, uh, show me your face, Lord, right? Show me your face. Like, it's just, it's setting the tone because, Lord, I just want to see what you want to show me. So put on your favorite worship song. Another thing you can do, maybe you go, you spend time with the Lord outside, uh, is, you know, you don't have to necessarily have music on. You can just say, man, Lord, I thank you for your beautiful creation, and you're just kind of worshiping the Lord in that manner, right? Actually, uh, next week, Pastor Mike is going to talk about how you individually encounter God. We believe here at the church there's 12 different ways in which you encounter God. And so we're all different, right? Every single person in this room is different in how you worship and how you encounter God, but we're all, in a way, the same. And so he's going to talk about that next week, so do not miss that. So you're setting the stage as you come into the secret place uh, by, through worship. The second thing that you're going to do in the secret place is you're going to ask for God to speak to you. You're going to ask for God to speak to you. So before you read the Word of God, you're setting the stage. Lord, I want to hear your voice. Lord, I want to see what you want to show me. You're asking the Lord to speak to you. So we can hear the Lord every single time that we open Scripture. Like that is the living Word of God. You want to hear the voice of God? You go to the Word of God. That is by far the most frequent way that you're going to hear the voice. Does he use prophecy? Yes. Does he use visions? Yes. But if you want to hear God, stop chasing after a word. It's going to come when it, when, it, when it happens and go into the word of God. That is how you hear his voice. 
That is why Jesus told us to pray, uh, give us this day our daily bread. It's not just talking about physical food, but it's also talking about the Word of God. We don't need to live off of revelation from yesterday. We need revelation from today. And so every time we open the Word of God, He wants to show us revelation for that day. Matthew 4.4 4 says this, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so we come into the secret place praying that simple prayer that I like to pray when we start off uh, here on Sunday mornings, Lord, speak for your servant is listening. The thing about that is Samuel prayed that prayer as a young boy. So you're coming in with childlike faith, knowing that you're going to receive from a God who's alive and saying to him, Lord, speak to me, Lord, for your servant is listening. Lord, I want to hear your voice today. So then you proceed and you open the word of God, which leads to uh, point number three this morning, Read the word. The third step is to read the word. Isaiah 66, 2 uh, says this, but on this one will I look. Say, look. On him who is poor and contrite in spirit and who trembles at my word. Who trembles at my word. So we read the word. Joshua 1, 8 says this, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Psalm 1, 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law he meditates day and night. So here, here's the thing uh, about this when you're going to read the word, okay? When you're going to go hear from the Lord, and you open his word, in which you should be meditating on, is you're reading again to encounter the Lord. And so when you feel like, okay, God is speaking to me through this particular thing in this moment, you stop. Your goal is not to complete a Bible reading plan, y'all. There's nothing wrong with having that. We need tools. And actually, you should have a Bible reading plan. But once you get to a place where the Lord is speaking to you through that, then what do you do? You pause and you study, you meditate on it, you pray through it. Because again, your goal is to encounter God. And so there's this proverb that, that I love. It's the, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, and it's the honor of kings to search it out. So what you're doing is you're reading the word of God, is when the Lord begins to speak through that, you're pausing and you're studying it, you're praying through it, and you're asking the Lord, Lord, what are you showing me here more and more, Right? So you don't have to necessarily complete your entire Bible reading plan. But do you need to have a plan going into this? Yes, you do. So here's my suggested, suggested plan, okay? This is not, I'm not saying you have to do this. This is just a suggestion. This is what I love to do. And what I love about this Bible reading plan uh, that, is that you're going to get a wide uh, array of subjects. And so the Holy Spirit through this will likely speak to you at some point through this word if you do it properly. And so what I love to do is I love to start off with what I call worship, wisdom, and Jesus, okay? Worship, wisdom, and Jesus. How? You're going to start off with a, a chapter in Psalms, a chapter in Proverbs, and then a chapter in one of the Gospels, right? And so you're getting worship, wisdom, and Jesus every single day. Can't go wrong with that, can you? So then you go into a chapter in the, in the New Testament, a chapter in the Old Testament, and then you read a chapter in Revelation, uh, what Revelation does is you're not studying it to figure out when he's returning. <laughs> what you're doing is you're, is, you're, is you're reading it to see the glory and the magnitude of his majesty, okay? The bigness of the Lord. Revelation has a way of doing that. What it also should do is Revelation should give you an urgency to live for the Lord, right? I've always said eschatology or study of end times should lead us to live urgent for the Lord to share the gospel. And so this Bible reading plan, I'm not, I'm not saying you should end your reading plan that you're doing right now and start this one. Don't do that. Continue whatever the Lord you're doing. But if you don't have a Bible reading plan, maybe try this one, right? I just believe it's a, it's a wide range, so you're going to hear from the Lord at some point. All right? So again, this is suggested. All right, the next thing that you do after you open the Word and you read it, number four, is you go through your personal prayer list. Go through your personal prayer list. So you begin by praying for yourself, your family, your friends, specific people as they come into your spirit, your work, the city of Jacksonville and Orange Park, uh, your church, Journey Church, your church leaders, your pastors, and then pray for peace in Israel. 
This is why you pray for peace in Israel. You might say, Adam, why am I praying for peace in Israel? That doesn't make any sense. They're way over there and we're over here. The Bible says that you were blessed. Blessed are those who bless Israel. I don't know about you, but man, I want every single blessing that is in the Word of God, right? I want every single blessing that's in the Word of God. So what are you doing? You're, you're, you're praying for Israel because you know the meaning behind that is you and yourself will be blessed. What I love to do is I, I keep uh, a, a prayer list in my notes. And so I, I open it up and I go through uh, whatever I'm praying for and believing for. There's something about consistency in prayer, right? There's something about standing on, on the Word of God that, man, His Word does not return void. And it says that um, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, right? If you go back to the parable of the, uh, we talked about at the beginning of the year of, of that widow who said, get justice for me from my adversary. And she was relentless in her prayer. So as you come before the Lord every single day to pray over this list, it does something. It sets something up and you're going to see God move in your life. It's a wonderful, beautiful thing. When you have that, you see, man, all the answered prayers which God has done in your life. Amen? The last thing that I want to give you uh, this morning is this. I would encourage you to do this. You conclude with two different prayers. Conclude with two prayers. The first prayer is this. Is search me, God, and know my heart. Search me, God, and know my heart. So as you're ending your time in the secret place with the Lord, you're asking the Lord to search your heart, to show you anything in your life that is not of Him. What this does in this moment is He's going to reveal any sin to you that you may not be aware of. And I say you may not be aware of because, man, whenever we sin, we need to have rapid repentance. That moment right there, man, we are asking God to forgive us, right? So, here, you're asking the Lord, search me, know my heart, show me anything with inside of me that is not of you, that is not pure, right? So he's really going to reveal any sin to you. The other thing that he, you're asking him to reveal to you in this moment as you're praying this prayer is you're asking the Lord to show any unforgiveness in your life. Is there someone that I am uh, walking in offense towards? You know, unforgiveness will hinder our, our, our relationship with the Lord almost more so than anything else. Jesus says, if, if you don't forgive, then I won't forgive you. I'm paraphrasing there. So we need to be quick to forgive other people. And oftentimes in life, man, somebody will do something to us, and it's a process to forgive, and I understand that. But as you're asking the Lord to help me to forgive this person, over time what ends up happening is you just forget that offense, and all of a sudden it's just not there anymore. Sometimes it does take time, but it's very important to search your heart for any unforgiveness in your life. We don't need to be carrying that unforgiveness around, do we? So in this moment, as we're with the Lord in the secret place, he's going to reveal it to us. He's also going to reveal it to us what are ways, what are things that, in which we are not obedient in. I'm not talking about even sin. I'm talking about what has he asked us to do that we haven't actually done yet. Oftentimes, we'll be looking for a word from God. God, give me direction right now for my life when he's already given you direction, but you haven't been bold enough to go out and to do what he's already asked you to do. So why are you then asking him to do something, to show you something when he's already shown you? You just need to go be obedient with that thing he's called you to be obedient in. Amen? So right then and there, you're saying, okay, Lord, search me, know my heart. Is there any sin in my life, any unforgiveness, any area I have not been bold enough to walk out in and to be obedient? Lord, would you give me the boldness to do that? The last prayer you're going to pray is this. Lord, guard my, uh, protect my mind, protect my eyes, protect my heart. Right? Because you're doing this at the very beginning of the day. And so you want the rest of your remainder of your day to walk in fellowship with the Lord. You don't want any distractions, right? So maybe something pops up on TV. You keep on flipping that channel, Right? Maybe something pops up on social media. You, you keep on scrolling. You're not, going to scroll, you're not going to stay there too long. Maybe somebody uh, says something to you and you feel offended. What you're doing is you're protecting your heart, your mind, your eyes from even receiving any type of offense in that moment, right? And so you're asking the Lord, Lord, protect me this day. You can pray that over your family too, man. L Lord, would you protect my kids' eyes, protect their heart, right? Protect them, God. Protect my family. So... This is all setting up so that you can see what God wants to show you. 
I just kind of want to give you very practical advice this morning on this. So, man, let me, let me end like this. My desire more than anything else in this congregation is for us to learn how to steward a personal relationship with God. We said, um, one of the things that we say around here a lot is that our corporate encounters with God would lead to what? Daily personal encounters with God. As we come into this room and we gather together and we encounter the presence of the Lord, that should give this desire inside of us then to go into the secret place to have a personal encounter on that level. And I just believe many of us, though, we don't know how to spend that time with the Lord in the secret place. And so we've got to kind of have a strategy going in because no plan, (laughs) if you don't have a plan when you're doing something, you're not going to be successful, right? And so we've got to develop that plan in the secret place. So maybe this morning you don't have that plan yet. Use this. Maybe this morning you already have a plan that kind of works for you. Maybe take some things from this this morning and incorporate it into your time with the Lord. Some of you in this room, you've never really developed this, this, this time in the secret place. I mean, it, it does take time to hear from the Lord. And I, I just kind of think as well, like, why is going into the secret place and spending time with the Lord, it feels like nowadays such a revolutionary thing to talk about, right? Like, it just feels like, okay, why is this something that uh, we don't do in our life? Because this is something that if, if the number one relationship is the Lord, why is waking up, you know, an hour, I'm talking to myself right now, I'm preaching to myself, why is waking up an hour earlier to go spend time with the Lord such a difficult thing for us if it's the number one relationship in our life? So I just encourage you, man, like go after the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. Do you rise with me? I want to pray for you. You know, what I, um, what I want more than anything else is just breakthrough here at the church. I want breakthrough where the Holy Spirit, like he literally has the room and there's uh, the presence of God is so available to every person who shows up in this room where they sense it and they know it. And I believe there's more of it. But really, it starts with us as a people developing this. Revival starts with a personal revival in our heart, right? It starts with a personal revival. So it might seem very basic this morning uh, on some level, but also on some level, it's like, why are we talking about this again? Because the reality is we as a people oftentimes don't get it, do we? I just want to challenge you, man, like, Create that discipline. Go after the Lord with everything you have and watch this intimate friendship with the Lord begin to develop. In a couple weeks, we're going to talk about rhythms you can put in your life to kind of even supercharge this this time with the Lord and what those rhythms should look like um, so that you're healthy as a human being, as a person. And again, Pastor Mike will talk about how we individually worship and encounter God. So every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to pray for you right now.